In the pursuit of happiness, how often is joy lost? People don't get, and so they are disappointed because of that. And then what is received is sometimes left behind for the next thing that is pursued. As happiness has more to do with the present, that is circumstances and situations, I suggest that joy has more to do with the presence, that is the abiding relationship with the Lord and his good will. The spirit God placed within humanity to draw us into relationship with him, as, as James noted in James 4, verses 4 through 5, uh, that is too often directed toward the temporal rather than toward the eternal. Oh, what God will provide for humanity if they would let him. We are, we are incomplete without the soul's relationship with God. And the experiences of life cannot be completely fulfilling without their eternal connection. And so what are we seeking as our source of joy? You know, how we focus on life is, is important. And, and our text this morning is, again, Jesus encouraging his disciples the night of, of his arrest. In John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11 is our text. But I want to back up a little bit and for a contrast at, at some of the words of, Ecclesiast, uh, of Solomon in Ecclesiastes as he looked at, at life. Is there validity or is there vanity? As Solomon acknowledged in Ecclesiastes 1, 2, where we read, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is, is vanity. Well, it doesn't have to be all vanity. He expresses again in chapter 12 and, and verse 8. But is it a meaningless uh, circle? You know, where is the, the, the value? Where is the, the meaning in, in our life? In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Beginning at verse 2, we read Solomon's words here. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuit the wind returns. All streams run to the oak, to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. <clears throat> All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, that is new. It has, al it has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance or former thing, uh, of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Here, the, the circle in all of that, where is the meaning in, in all of that? You know, without the God connection, life would be left without meaning and the significance that God brings to it. Again, noting Solomon's words in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and beginning of verse 17, he says, So I hated life <clears throat> because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the, the toil of my labors under the sun, because... Sometimes a person who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? 
for all his days are full of sorrow. And his work is a vexation. E even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given, for, for to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the busyness of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving the wind. As we think about joy, and Jesus talked with his disciples about the joy being complete and being, being full, we need to consider our life lived in connection with God. Otherwise, where is the meaning? It's just going round in, in circles and, and what is really accomplished for ourselves but only to be left for another. This is joy, not, not merely for the moment, but an, an abiding joy that we can find in the relationship with God. Happiness is often because of, that is because of the, the experience of the moment, whereas joy can be in spite of some of the circumstances and some of the situations of the moment. We find these words in, in the prophecy from Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3, 17 and 19, where we read, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the tree, uh, on the vines. The, pro the produce of the oil fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He puts my feet he makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. See, it's, it's not merely putting on a, a happy face, but, but a happy faith that feeds steadfast joy in our life. We most, what most gives um, a needed facelift is a faith lift. And so the Lord's joy and ours Jesus says to his disciples in John 15, 9 through 11, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now this would encompass all the things that Jesus had been discussing with his disciples and, and providing them some, some uh, comfort. But here, Jesus was facing his own suffering and, and facing his own death, and he talked about joy. Perhaps consolation and peace were timely subjects as he addressed those issues and, and appropriate, but, but to think about joy in view of what he was going to experience. Jesus stated all this because he had joy. And he wanted his disciples to experience that same joy. The disciples needed reassurance so that their joy would not depart. A joy associated with um, what brought and what brings Jesus joy. This is a joy that centers on the divine relationship. We see this in Jesus and his, his connection with the Father and all that he was doing. Uh, for Jesus, there was that continual approval of the Father as he carried out the plan. We find that in his baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 27 where the voice from heaven says, uh, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, similar words, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But then added there is, Listen to him. And then even earlier here, you know, following uh, the, uh, the, the raising of Lazarus from the dead and the continued opposition uh, uh, against Jesus and prior to his being in the upper room with his disciples in John 12, 27 to 28, there we have read, um, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. 
Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Joy in the oneness, the unity of the relationship. And there was joy in the purpose of, of behind all the things that Jesus was, was doing because they were all done in fulfillment of the divine will. So one writer says, Jesus possessed a joy and a peace that no suffering or evil surroundings, not even the suffering of the cross, could disturb. And the writer of Hebrews expressed this idea of the joy Jesus experienced even in view of what he was going to go through in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, where we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Even going through the cross with joy set before him, in spite of the trials, there was joy. It, despite the difficulty, there was joy. Are we also understanding that joy in spite of life's challenges? His anticipation of salvation for others inspired his endurance and filled him with joy. The Lord's obedience revealed the divine love that Jesus addressed here and, and urged the disciples to abide in his love as they abided in his, his commands. John 14, 31 but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. And so for the disciples to, to have this same joy, Jesus urged them to abide in his love, such as exhibited through submission to his will, as it will be with us also. As branches connected to the vine, as we noted last week in John 15, verse 5, they would produce a fruit. They would be fruitful for him. They would share then his joy in that fruitfulness of, of their own spiritual growth. Uh, it was a life identified with their master. Do we find joy in our connection with the Lord? That he is our Lord. He is our master. He is our savior. And it is a life consistent with his mind and with his purpose that brings us joy. Because we you know life is, is not going just in, in circles and it's not grasping wind but it is being involved in those things that we are fed by his, his spirit that lead us to a higher plane, that lead us to a, a higher uh, object for living our life. Through their continuance in his service, they, as we, were laborers together with God. Paul noted in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. But there, there are many things in life we can acknowledge that can sap our joy if we allow them to do so. So where is our focus resting? Do we have a faith focus that feeds our joy? Some Christians appear to have been weaned on pickle juice uh, because they just don't seem to be joyful uh, as they, they are going through, through life. Uh, a gloomy Christian seems to be a, a, a contradiction in and, and of its, itself. Uh, it reminds me of the story of the, the child who, whose uh, father was very religious but very stoic uh, about it. And he, he was going around the, the farmyard and he saw the donkey with a long face. And he says, oh, poor donkey has grandpa's religion too. Do we go through life with a long face, stoically, or do we exude joy because of our relationship with the Lord? The experience of this joy can be found in the sharing of our possessions. That is a thing of, of blessing. As Paul was giving his farewell uh, to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. In verses 34 to 35, we read here, You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed 
to give than to receive? Are we finding that joy in giving? Are we, we finding joy in that truth that it is more blessed to give than to receive? Yes, sometimes we will be on the receiving end. And in order for others to give, we need to be on the receiving end. But are we just receiving or are we finding that joy and that blessing of joy in eagerness to give? This willingness comes because of the relationship. We find that with the Macedonian Christians who were impoverished in, in their, their region, and yet they, they wanted to participate in that collection for needy saints in Jerusalem. And Paul addresses this in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5, in and, and trying to encourage the, the Corinthian Christians to, to follow through on their commitment. And he says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to the will of God, then by the will of God to us. You see, it began with their relationship with the Lord. They had first given themselves to the Lord. If they'd given themselves, and if we have given ourselves to the Lord, then whatever we have, whatever we possess, also belongs to the Lord. Are we giving it as service to the Lord? Are we using it as service or in service to the Lord? There's joy in sharing of self. You know, Paul, as he wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15, he, he addresses his relationship and the, the genuineness of his relationship with them in stating, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? You know, Jesus lost himself in serving others. And we are to serve as he served. And this seems to be the way in which Paul served. Self-sacrifice as, as our Lord self-sacrificed. And Paul was willing to give his very being on behalf of the Christians there at Corinth. As well as whatever he possessed. And there is joy also in, in harmony our unity with one another as Christians, as, as members of the Lord's body. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, Paul says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. As Paul was writing as a prisoner in Rome, he found great joy in knowing the unity that there was among believers. But we also experience that joy in our unity together. Harmony with the Father's purpose. Harmony with the Father's approval. You're walking as our Lord walked in, in harmony. Walking in harmony and in unity with one another. But there's joy even in loss. In view of what is true gain that we can receive. The writer of Hebrews encouraged Christians going through severe trial. In Hebrews 10, 32 to 36, he says, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to, to reproach and, uh, and affliction and sometimes be in partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Can you imagine that? They joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. How can you do that? He goes on to say, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive 
what is promised. Are we keeping it all in, in perspective or have we become so attached to our stuff that we forgot what is of truly great value? Are we so attached to our, our possessions that we, 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 we just can't not bear the idea of giving them up or, or having them taken away or, or do they mean so little to us that you know, whatever it is that we're experiencing, we have something greater that still lies ahead of us. Like Jesus, joy focused even because of the outcome of the trials. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In James, in James 1, 2 through 4, he says, count it all joy. He doesn't say, be happy about it. He, he doesn't say, this is a source of happiness. He doesn't say, count it all fun. He says, count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, joy because of these signs of a maturing faith as we walk on in Christ. But also joy, experience the joy and the con consciousness of God's abiding presence with us. These are sources of joy, regardless of what may go, be going on around us. This is a joy that is deep. This is a joy that was, was developed by the disciples as they were bold and not timid and continuing to move forward in sharing the gospel message. In Acts chapter 5 and verses 40 to 41, there we read, And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Beaten, and yet they rejoiced because of their association with the Lord and their focus on the mission that had been given to them. And then in Acts chapter 16, 22 to 25, as, as, as Paul and Silas are, are in a Philippian jail, we read, the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prisons and fastened their feet in the stocks. They'd been beaten. They were arrested. They were beaten. And then they were placed in, in a probably a damp and, and dark prison, unlike our prisons in this country uh, today. And yet, what do they do? We read about midnight, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. The experience had not caused them to lose their song. Have experiences of life taken away our song and taken away our joy or can we maintain the joy and maintain the song? How could Paul really be threatened with death? He wanted to go home. He, he joyfully looked forward to the end of his race but he continued in ministry as long as he was in this life. Joy within, as one says, made happy in trouble, hopeful in sorrow, buoyant in depressed circumstances, and joyous even in tribulation. This is a joy because of the depth of faith. Peter, writing in the first Peter 1, 8 through 9, says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. This is in reference to, to seeing, not, not seeing Jesus, because Jesus had ascended by this time of Peter's writing. And so, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. A joy that naturally arose because of a relationship. A joy that naturally arose that, that you couldn't describe, couldn't express perhaps in words, but it was there. Inexpressible, but yet it's expressed through the life 
in the manner in which life is gone through. Words may fail us, but it's the life showing the joy that is ours because of the relationship with Jesus. And it is an ever abiding joy. Further from the text that we're looking at this morning uh, in, in John, in John chapter 16, while Jesus is still speaking to his disciples, in verses 20 to 22, we read there, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she will sorrow because of her because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Oh, they would sorrow when Jesus was on the cross and they would wonder when Jesus was in the tomb, but Jesus would appear to them and they would be filled with a joy that could not be taken away. Birth, new birth of, of ideas and, and understanding of what Jesus had come to accomplish and the message of the gospel that they would carry on based on upon that. They would have a joy. There would be a time when the world would rejoice with Jesus on the cross thinking that they had conquered this uh, heretic. And that would be a time of sorrow for the disciples. But there would become a time when their sorrow would turn to joy. A joy that could not be taken away from them. An abiding joy. And they pressed on in their ministry in that joy. Many of them, most of them, even to the point of death. Are we maintaining the proper focus in life? We need to in order to maintain this joy that Jesus desires us to experience, that our, his joy may be full in us. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, we read, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice. Again, like Paul, I will say, rejoice. Let us be filled with the joy of the Lord as we continue on through life, knowing what is ours because of the relationship, knowing what he has accomplished on our behalf. So let us pray in order to ward off anxiousness and let, that we maintain joy. Let us be thankful for what we ought to be thankful so that we can maintain this joy. Joy, knowing that we are loved. Joy in the right relationship. Joy in doing and living right. Joy in knowing we have been redeemed. Joy in knowing we are ultimately victorious in Christ. And joy in seeing others who are being drawn to the Lord to know the salvation that is ours in Him. There's a poem called Sheer Joy, written by Ralph Spaulding of Cushman. It goes like this. Oh, the sheer joy of it, living with thee, God of the universe, Lord of a tree, maker of mountains, lover of me. Oh, the sheer joy of it, breathing thy air, morning is dawning, gone every care, all the world singing, God's everywhere. Oh, the sheer joy of it, walking with thee, out on the hilltop, down by the sea, Life is so wonderful, life is so free. Oh, the sheer joy of it, working with God, running his errands, waiting his nod, building his heaven on common sod. Oh, the sheer joy of it, ever to be, living in glory, living with thee, Lord of tomorrow, lover of me. Is the Lord's joy complete in our life? Are we full of the Lord's joy? 
Are we listening to his promises and his assurance? Are we focusing on what he has accomplished on our behalf so that in us his joy may be full? Be joyful. We have much for which to be joyful.